Russell Kane. He's known as a multi-award winning comedian, presenter, actor, author, and scriptwriter. But man, this guy is so much more. I started doing all this biohacking and to survive on less sleep, to not lose your hair, or to slow down the aging process. It fucked my life in the proper sense. Everything fell apart like a junkie. How can I get more of that? My relationship with my girlfriend fell apart. My bills started to not be paid. I started to look thin. It's the closest thing to a drug addiction that I've ever experienced. Russell Kane. He's known as a multi-award winning comedian, presenter, actor, author, and scriptwriter. But man, this guy is so much more. He's genuinely, deeply intellectually curious, something that honestly surprised me. And this sounds like it might be offensive or a weird thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. I didn't realize how smart this guy is, remarkably self-aware. And on, to top it all off, brutally honest, he says it how it is. He has an ability to point out things that I think most of us muggles miss. And he's also genuinely just a really nice and hilarious human being. Today, you won't hear many jokes. This is the more serious side of Russell Kane, and a side of him that I did not know and would not have guessed before speaking to him. So without further ado, I'm Stephen Bartlett, and this is The Diary of a CEO. I hope nobody's listening, but if you are, then please keep this to yourself. Hello. One, <laughs> one of the things I read when I was um, reading about your story was a quote. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to read the quote to you. You said, I remained a boy while he was alive, even when I was 18, and I needed to be a man to tell these stories. What were you talking about when you said that? Um, well, I don't think that's true of just me. I think any boy or probably girl who has a reasonably overbearing and dominant father, you sort of remain a, a child. Now that I'm a, a father myself, I can see that's true. So when my daughter Minna is 40, she's still going to be my, my baby. So that's the positive side of it. <laughs> the negative side of it is if it's quite an overbearing masculine energy, you, you sort of, I felt sometimes a bit like a bonsai, like I kept nearly growing and then the roots were trimmed. So I was fully grown, but small. Mm. So if my dad was in the room, you know, I was instantly childlike, I would say, in, inside. So it's just a very dominating figure. And I think that would have been the same had my dad not dropped down dead from a heart attack years ago. I think that would have been the same when I'd been 40, 50, 60. If my dad had been a 90-year-old shouting in the corner, I probably still would have been like that. Even if he wasn't in the room? No, no. When as soon as what in his presence, I think. But so far as this, that, I think that quote might be talking about stand up. Yeah, I wouldn't have dared to tell the funny stories about him while he was alive. I don't think just on the risk he he was offended or you know there'd be consequences. What was he like for anybody that hasn't read your, about your story? Um, steroid taking, shaven headed, silver back doorman, right wing, angry, council estate, working class, barbell, curl, semi-professional, bodybuilder, lifeguard, sheet metal worker, lagger, nutter. By lagger, I don't mean someone who gets on it. I mean someone who puts the insulation on the outside of pipes. The hardest job you can imagine, crawling in boilers, ripping out asbestos, fiberglass, cut hands, white transit van, get out of the way. <laughs> Just massive. Shirts, Tailored. This is when he's taking steroids. That was before I was born. Shirts tailored, trousers split in Hulk like at the thigh. Just a force of meat called Dave. Wow, that, that was my dad. Actually called Dave. Dave. Actually called Dave from Essex. Um. So yeah, he was just very old school. So even though he's like more like someone who was born in about 1920, he had sort of the politics and the attitude, very unreconstructed masculinity quite knuckle draggy, but just would just you know, worked himself to death to provide, barely raised his voice at me, certainly never laid a finger at me, but didn't didn't need to. I find the truly terrifying Cockney can just give you some, are you fucking getting near now and you're, you're done. I, 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 I actually piss came out of my body once when he spoke to me like that. Really? I literally <laughs> pissed myself. I was, I'd thrown my brother on the bed and he was crying 
And there's nothing scarier than hearing those doom, doom, doom on the stairs if you've done something to your brother or sister and you know your dad's coming up the stairs. And he's like, what happened? What have you done to your brother? And I just pissed myself. And that guy never laid a finger on me. That's power. <laughs> my, That's, my mum definitely laid a finger yeah. on me. I don't think I would have been scared of her if she didn't. But I was fucking terrified of my mum. Like, but she, but she would beat me. Like, but my, but I couldn't imagine how she could have achieved that same objective without hitting me with something. It's, it's, it would be analogous of the nuclear deterrent threat. Uh, if you know I've got nuclear weapons, I don't need to fire them for you not to attack me. So I know, I knew my dad had nuclear. Where, whereas, and this sounds incredibly sexist, but the reality is, once you're a 14, 15 year old lad, you're the same size as your mum. Mm. There are no you know, where are the nuclear weapons? She's going to have to put her money where her mouth is. And but haven't you got to know how nuclear weapons work to, to know that they're... I, did, I just, need to, you just needed to look at my... You know, you just, to be honest with you, my dad's given me so many positive things. It's just that the negative things are funny. So that's why I talk about them disproportionately. Mm. But to teach someone, I'm five foot ten, like a pepper army with hair on. But when I stand on stage, I don't need to hit people or shout they they sit in their seats and some of them in the front row shit themselves if I even look at them. So who have I learned that from? It's partly my craft, but it's partly also what a good teacher has, uh, what a good dad has, like my dad, and what a good stand-up has, male or female, that authority to stand there and hold a room with a reasonable tone in the voice, pin drop. Mm. It's, it's powerful. It's harder for a, a, a mum to do that, particularly where I grew up, there's a lot of single mums. Um, when you've got teenage lads that are sort of thinking, what are you going to do? She's, so it becomes like an arms race where the mum starts hitting the legs mm. and hitting the face. <laughs> and it's needed because that's what the mum's got to work with, I suppose. That's why, that's why I do believe this is so sexist and old school. But I do believe, if not a man, two parental figures in in place one who can play the badass doesn't matter if it's two women two men whatever i think if you've got two it's double the force raising a child mm -hmm. takes a village Are you i remember you know the, the way you've described your dad is um is quite different from who you are today and who you are over the last 10 years i mean yeah in almost the antithesis and i remember reading about the, the fact that you took a dna test at some point uh, <laughs> no i took a dna test just out of curiosity because i'm big into to science i wanted to know what diseases i was carrying i've always been fascinated about my ethnic makeup because my family history starts in living memory and i'm obviously a little bit darker than i should be to be a brit <laughs> so i was sort of, I, wanted, I was interested to know what was in there uh, but part of me did go would, what if this is the moment I discover my dad's not my my dad? It did cross my mind, which is totally absurd. Sorry, mum, if you're watching. Um, because he was blonde hair, blonde curly hair, blue eyes, very wide. Um, it's just that we're just not, nothing in common. My brother is the spit of my dad, but I'm like I'm like my mum, just energetic, pepper army with hair on, running around, bouncing out of bed, stick first thing in the morning. And like gen in terms of like generational cycles. Where did he, your dad get it from? So he always used to say to me, I never had a dad. So oh, right. I, okay. so, and then my mum would, my mum would say, so you've got to understand your dad didn't get taught how to be, my mum's a gay man. Your mum didn't get taught <laughs> how, your mum, your dad didn't get taught how to be a dad. So he just know, he didn't know how to be around babies. He never learned that sort of thing. He never, he didn't have anyone to guide him. So he had quite a rough childhood. His, his dad walked out on him when he was about, I think he was about two. And my dad's mum's hard as nails, East, East End, Essex, well, it's Essex back then, Barking. And it was just a tough childhood, you know, tough East London, Essex childhood where you, you just survived, basically. And uh, he, he had a lot of dreams. I think he would have liked to have gone the same way I did. He was quite a good looking bloke, so he got sc scouted for modelling and things like that. He pursued that for a bit. He pursued the professional bodybuilding. He even tried stand up, I think like at a Pontins or a Butlins. He tried a little bit of acting only for a couple of years. And then he went into the hardest, I think, of all the manual labor you can do, which is sheet metal and insulation. So that, like I say, crawling along pipes and all that. So there's a, bit, there's a lot of bitterness, a lot of unrealized dreams, a lot of abandoned by your dad, a lot of hardness and negativity there from the childhood. And that plagued him his whole life. So if we were on a beautiful four-star holiday to Menorca and the sun's shining, part of him would be thinking about the five-star holiday he could have. I'm not like that at all. How did you know, how did you know he was thinking that? Well, he would voice it half the time. 
Huh? What were you saying? Uh, yeah, it's all right. Imagine, imagine if I get the big job. Imagine if we would come back. He'd be quite positive on holiday, actually. But he was like, just imagine, Julie, if we if we had more. That's my mum, of course, Julie and Dave. If we had more money, that house we could have. And my mum would be like, Dave, we li- we bought our own council house. Thanks, Thatcher. It's a big house, the biggest house in the street. We've got pillars out the front. Yes, it's a former council house. But we've got pillars. We've got a swimming pool in the garden. Three beautiful bedrooms, lovely bathroom, massive house, dining room, front room. They're two healthy sons at the point. My brother's very unwell by the time he was 17. But at that point, you know, what was there to be negative about? My, it's a hard job my dad did, but good money. But he couldn't see that. He could just see his mate who started a glass company and now his son drove a Lambo and he lived in Chigwell and I don't. And when my dad passed away, we were going through the shed at the bottom of the garden and I found his diary. And it was lit. It was honestly, it was one of the few things that made me cry when he died because I sort of toughened up to help with the funeral and all that because my brother was ill by then. And uh, it's just rain today. Didn't get the job. Shit day. James being a, can I swear? Yeah. James being a cunt. And that's my brother. Shit day. In Ada Curry, it was like the diary of someone in prison. That's what it was like. It was, it's so weird that someone could be rich and not know it. I'm, I love making money, don't get me wrong, but I'm really good at enjoying what I've got. So I've enjoyed every level of my comedy journey and I've never been bothered about whether I go further or not. Because I feel like if you can have two banging holidays a year and you love the house you're living in and your family's healthy, done. He was engaging in upward social comparisons, right, the whole time. And if you do that, you're never going to be happy. Absolutely. Right? And you see that with people in, in my profession that are earning a million pounds a year, two million pounds a year, and are in debt because they're buying an AP watch every week and they're going to the Maldives four times a year and they've got the, they're in a 10 million pound house, so they should be in a five million pound house. It's ridiculous. Mm. That's consumerism. But it works on a more micro level. So we would, if we're going to Stansted Airport to fly to Menorca, Traffic's probably going to be shit on the way to the airport. I bet you the traffic will be shit. So we're already, he's pre-imagining the traffic jam we'll be in. If we hit a traffic jam, fucking knew it. Holiday, we'll probably miss the flight. Holidays, fuck Julie. I fucking told you we should have gone first. I fucking told you. He didn't shout at me, but he would shout to himself sort of thing. Mm. Did you ever figure out where he learned that behaviour, where that came from? No idea. Like I say, it was just all the bitterness and negativity and expecting things to go wrong. That was his tape, his script. So if we were in a restaurant and I'd be seven years old and I'd spill a glass of water, not Coke or anything, so he's not going to get sticky legs, he'd be like, water everywhere, fucking meal ruined. I've got to sit here like I piss myself for the end time. he would be like, the worst thing in the world has happened. Like someone at that moment's probably found a lump on their body. But to my dad, the worst thing that can happen. So he, I felt sorry. Looking back now, you got to, you got to feel compassion and love because it was just a constant tide of self-hating negativity, basically, and imagining if we go and buy um, something from uh, Ikea that needs putting up, you know a screw will be missing, and it's because I'm me, because I'm cursed. A fucking screw will be missing. You can guarantee it. Fucking hell. That, all the time. So for a little boy growing up, you've got to work really hard not not to absorb that. I I see hints of that in my dad, especially as he got older, a little Mm. bit more negative about everything, moods you know seem to be irritable at a lot of things and one of the things that crossed my mind was i hope this isn't genetic (laughs) like how do i avoid becoming this guy when i get Mm. to that age has that crossed your mind that the generational cycle might continue to some degree without you noticing obviously yeah i mean see him so my brother i don't i can't really go into my brother's illness because he's literally not well enough to consent for me to talk about it Otherwise, I would happily discuss it because it's an important subject to talk about. But he's got some severe mental health issues. Let's just leave it there. So my brother's really sort of un- refreshingly unaware of his mannerisms and gestures and postures, if you like. And it's just like my, it is like my old man. So how can your, you know, the way, your voice and the cadence of a sentence and the glances and the way you, you say, no, I mean, and stuff like that, it is my old man. So, I mean, on some genetic level, there are copies of, how we express ourselves, there must be. But apart from maybe your height, I can't think of anything you can't change with loads of loads of ways. Education, cognitive behavioural therapy if you need it. I never have, but you can. Um, you can work on the way you eat, your diet, your lifestyle, all of those. You know, genetics is not destiny. One of the most fascinating things you can look up is identical twin studies over and over again. You get one twin that's two inches taller than the other. 
where, where he's had a, a more successful, not two inches, but it might be an inch taller, where he's had a more successful life eating better food. So you can literally grow taller. They're, they're genetically identi identical. Mm -hmm. So you can't tell me I'm destined to suddenly be negative about traffic jams if two identical twins can be different in height. You must be able to push against behaviour. You see like, that film, Three Identical Strangers? Yes, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Absolutely you fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Made me upset. Yeah. It's, it's inspired, you know, the ending's obviously tragic, but uh, yeah, really powerful film. And I think that shines a light on how... It does. It's, it, it gives hope for all of us that you're not, you're only 50% of your dad and 50% of your mum. And uh, although you're actually slightly more of your your mum, I've learned how anyway. But um, so you don't, you're not, if you're only 50%, if twins aren't destined to be the same you're not destined to be the same as a mm. parent. It's 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 bad. It's a bad way to think, particularly if it's a negative. It's a good way to think if there's something you want to copy, tell yeah. yourself it, chant it. <laughs> I want to be more like my mum. She's such a cool cat or whatever. We've, we, we, we have also grown up in a slightly different culture, especially in the last sort of 10, 20 years where we're much more aware of our psychology, right? Mm. And, our, and, our, and how trauma and childhood experiences have shaped us as adults. Whereas I think my dad probably didn't know. So it was like someone back there in the control room running the show without him and he was just a puppet to the shit he'd been through whereas we are kind of a bit more open as a society now so yeah that that's my biggest learning Men mental health comes on a spectrum it doesn't mean mentally Ill. we have mental health yeah. everyone has if we have physical health we have mental health even if you have no issues that's good you are mental health so mental health runs on on a spectrum to people that are cooking on four hobs like me and you hopefully all the way down to people like my brother who is severely severely ill with cognition issues and people who are severely ill or people who are trapped in time, like our dads before an awakening, they don't have insight into their current state. If you do not have insight into your condition, you are screwed. Because if you're, let's say, for example, schizophrenic, without insight into the fact you have schizophrenia, you will not take the medicine. You just won't take it. You'll look at the pill and go, well, I don't, I'm not ill. So you'll, you'll be in assisted accommodation your entire life. If you're schizophrenic, but know you have schizophrenia, chances are you can have a relatively normal life because you know, I'm ill, I need to take my medicine. Mm. And that, but you can translate that thinking to any aspect of business or commerce, to stand ups, to entrepreneurs, because I've noticed, I call it black box thinking from the Matthew Syed book. The moment you can have insight into a stand-up routine or into a business proposition in a proper way where you can look at it and go, that doesn't work, you're going to be successful. People that don't have insight into themselves in their personal lives, they end up single, they end up in unhappy relationships because they can't see their own faults. They can't insight into themselves and go this. Quick one, starting from the minute the lockdown is lifted, we're going to start bringing in some of our subscribers to watch how this podcast is produced behind the scenes. It means you get to meet the guests, meet myself and see how we put all of this together. If you want that to be you, all you've got to do, hit the subscribe button. I mean, this is just an impossibly tough question. Yeah. Because we're talking about self-awareness really, right? So like how does, and people, people have asked me this question for the last five years and I really don't have a great answer still. How does one become more self-aware? Well, I, it was literally part of my degree. So oh, great. Uh, Perfect. I've, uh, <laughs> I'm very lucky. Here so we I, go. <laughs> I, start, I started doing English literature because I wanted to do the most show off, uncounsel estate, posh subject possible. I, I mean, I was going to get a, a first, or I was, I don't know what was going to happen. So I told myself I'm going to get a first no matter what. That was preordained. Uh, so I did two years of showing off about, you know, Roland Barts and Jane Austen and all that. And there was an opportunity in the last year to cross over into creative writing. And the reason I did that, this again goes back to my dad. It's not very practical to be absolutely badass on Jane Austen unless you're going to want to be a lecturer or an academic. Whereas creative writing um, is a practical profession. You can go into advertising. You can go into journalism. Mm. You can try and write books. You can, as it turns out, go into stand-up. I didn't know that yet. There's loads of places where you can go, look, i am not just got a first in English. I've got a first in, in writing. I can take body copy and make your brand pop. So... Part, how do you do a dissertation in creative writing? There's only one way. You have to submit 10,000 words, normal academic poncing about, and you have to submit 10,000 word short story play, but you have to run through your own work and criticize it and say what you got right and what you got wrong. Once you've been through that and done it loads of times, you, it's, it just becomes natural to bring it to your life. A copywriter in an advertising agency has to be able to really 
hate the, his own work he just created and find the faults in it because that will lift it above Ogilvy's copywriter and mm -hmm. you'll win the pitch. It's as, it's as simple as that. The person, the man who cannot realise he's domineering or jealous and work on that will not have a fruitful relationship in with order a woman to, or, a, or a man indeed. In order to do that with your life or with your copy or with your work or whatever in marketing, you have to have a certain level of self-esteem and sec personal security to be to allow yourself to rise above your work and look back down on it in a critical way a lot of mm. people's self-esteem is so fragile yeah that the prospect of being critical is uh, it's just unthinkable like you know and this is why people get def from my experience why people get so defensive and because mm -hmm. they're because they're, they're so f if you one shot to their self-esteem will take the whole house down so that they immediately go like this ha like so you could look at it that way. So I would say that person needs to learn not self-esteem because self-esteem is a totally separate conversation. They need to learn objectivity. A piece of writing is a thing. A relationship is a, th a thing mm -hmm. that you've built with someone. Um, a comedy routine is a thing. A poem is a thing. The things over there, that's not you. You have to practice being able to take the piss out of the thing, criticise the, the thing. No, someone's not coming up to you and going, you're ugly, um, you're unlovable, uh, you've got a big nose, you're not tall enough. Stuff like that is going to hurt and there's no way of getting objective. But if you can't look at a poem you've written and someone goes, I really love the metre, but the adjective there's a bit obvious, then you should be able to thank that person. They're giving you a gift if they know their shit. But you're the one that should be saying that first. Eminem style, 8 Mile, seize the bars and turn them on yourself first. Hard to do. <laughs> Because but, but everything just makes like, better work. It makes better work. It yeah, makes better humans. Yeah. I completely agree. It's just really tough to do. Like Practice. It's, yeah, it's practice. practice. I, I get a lot of, um, I, this is the message I get most often sent to me via my agent or on Instagram and it drives me fucking nuts. I had one the other week. Oh my God, I love what you do. I'm, I'm a really funny person. This is how it was phrased the other week. How, how many gigs would I have to do before I could like open for you? on tour can you have a look at some stuff i filmed on my phone and i'm i give them an answer that normally i never get a reply to this answer i say okay it's quite simple lucky for you there is a really simple model to follow you need to work unpaid for three years in the clubs three times a week i wouldn't recommend a relationship and just warn your friends you're not going to see them i started to earn about two three hundred pounds a week after five years at that point, you're ready to give up your day job. On about the eighth or ninth year, you're going to be ready to do a support slot. I never get that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, people don't want to hear it. Yeah. But you, if you went up to the guy in the gym who's 16 stone and 5% body fat and go, can you tell me how I can get like that? He'd say, the machines are over there, dickhead. Just yeah. get going. Yeah, yeah. The machines are there. You cannot skip the machine. You cannot skip the tricep station if you want triceps. You can't just go, but it's going to hurt. Uh, it's too much work to get a tricep. Then just don't get triceps. Don't, but don't moan if you don't have triceps. Uh, head to the dip station and see you in four years. I completely, yeah. I, now I've, I wrote about this. My book came out last week and I wrote about it in my book. I remember someone turning to me. It was actually the CEO of my company now. Company I've just left. And he said to me, Steve, you know, this personal brand stuff and this like speaking you do on stage. He was like, how long did it, like, how do I, he was like, how do I, how do I do it? And in your, your brain immediately scrambles around looking for like three tips. Yeah. Right. Three tips to describe like a deck. I remember my first talk in school at 14 years old, my hands shaking. Absolutely. The truth is like someone's seen you with a sharp sword and they've said, how do I get a short sword that sharp? So, well, start sharpening it now and then yeah. 10 years time. But, but people don't want no, that. No one no. wants to hear the answer is boring, repetitive practice. For most, most people that are absolutely fucking excellent at something have done a lot of boring, repetitive practice that would be boring to the person asking the question, yeah. not to us. Yeah, I yeah. loved every shit gig I did. And that's the difference. That's what kept you doing it for 10 years or two decades or whatever, is that you genuinely intrinsic loved it for its, and that's, people want the rewards, right? But, but when they, if they started and genuinely wanted it, they too would discover that love. If you, if you say, I want to be a, a dentist, I want to be a dentist, you start dental training and you're finding it boring in a slog, newsflash, you don't actually want to be a dentist. You'll be rich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So find something else. Find something where you love the journey. That is a secret. So that's what my dad never found. He, did, he didn't find a job he took pleasure in. It's got nothing to do with coin, although I'm into it. But mm. if you love the outdoors, you're going to love landscaping, whether you're on 17 grand a year or, or 17 million a year. You're going to love it because that's what you were born to do. It's such a counter narrative to the narrative that sells, which is like short investment, big returns. It's like seven days, six pack abs. That's a, everyone fucking signs up for that. 
Imagine, imagine that the like ten years, maybe, maybe <laughs> that, that's true. And that's and the problem is a lot of the t the TV we make, I make, it sells that X Factor spot, do one song, live the pimp lifestyle. Now, of course, that is what in the all of the X Factor that's ever been on, and all of pop star the rivals. How many of those people are now platinum selling artists living in mansions? What Harry Styles? Try and name some. One Direction, that's it. <laughs> that, that's it. That's out of every single little mix doing well. That's out of every single one in a show that's designed to push people to the front in an artificial way. So if you think that's going to happen, if you're Russell from Essex, you're deluded. It's But any business, if you're passionate, mixed with a little bit of luck, people, this is the other thing people like us don't like putting out there, but I'm afraid there is a, a bit of luck involved. Mm. And it's sort of causing to, like we always sat here going, I've worked so hard. Oh, look at me with my, my work hard badge. But at some point we had some luck as well, yeah. just we're in the right place, right time, mixed with the hard work. So some people are more lucky than others. Luck is a thing. And what luck is, not luck as in lottery number luck, but luck as in, oh my God, you've met the, you've met the perfect partner. You got the, you went the business. Oh, you you were looking for a French uh, a French bulldog breed, and you found exactly the right one at the right time when you were looking for a puppy. Why are you so lucky? Why is my life so shit? So they tested this. They got a bunch of people together. Half people who say my life's shit, I'm so unlucky, and half people like me who like I've got to admit I'm a bit ble I'm ble hashtag blessed. I do have a lot of luck. And they run tests on them. And the test they run was very simple. The, the psychologist, I can't remember, he's the British Jewish guy, really funny, brings loads of books out, Richard something or other. He's written a book about it, about luck, look it up. They gave him a newspaper each and they went in there, go into your separate rooms and on a page is a picture you're looking for. Whoever finds that picture comes in first, gets a hundred pounds cash. That was the game. So everyone went in like that. On page two, in massive headlines was, it's a trick, stop turning. If you've read this headline, go and collect the money. That was on page two. All the unlucky people missed that. All the lucky people found it. Really? Do you know why? Because lucky people are eyes are open. The hustlers. So it turns out you can make luck. You can practice that. You can hone it. That's something you can hone. Next time you walk into a meeting, just think, right, what's what's that guy do for for a living? Who's that? Is that a contact? That's not luck if I sit down next to someone and he happens to be doing a, a comedy streaming service startup and he signs me up. That's me being a bit bold and striking up a conversation and looking at what he's wearing and having a think. You can learn these skills. People don't like that because that sharp puts the mirror on me and creates personal responsibility where I, yep. you know what I mean? And, and I feel like in our society at the moment, this is just an observation I've had, personal responsibility is people fucking hate that. Yeah. I did a, I remember doing a tweet about, um, cause okay, this was me playing a bit of fuckery, but I don't care, right? So the left of society, which I probably consider myself to be on, are really in support of the NHS. So I did a tweet saying the biggest cost to the NHS is like smoking, eating bad, et cetera. So if you really care about the NHS, mm. take care of yourself. Da -da -da. Oh, people are like, no, Steve, this is literally the, the replies are like, this is not it. Mm. Because I'm basically saying, if you genuinely care about the health service, here's all the data. The biggest burden on the NHS is people that are overweight and mm. people that are smoking or whatever. Um, well, like the, the obesity one's particularly controversial because there's two movements at the same time. There's personal responsibility in the science we're learning about obesity, particularly during COVID. I mean, if you if, if you want to do one thing other than social distancing, obviously get a vaccine, but most of us are too young to have had a vaccine. So if you haven't had the vaccine and you don't and you don't want to live life like a prisoner, the best thing you can do is get in shape quick. They, you're better off. You're literally better off being, a, I think, a thin smoker. Literally, literally, yeah. But it's a controversial conversation because. Quite rightly, we're reevaluating beauty standards and a lot of people end up with eating disorders and fat shaming and all that it needs to go away. And as, as soon as we associate personal responsibility, longevity and health with a body type, we're in a difficult area where we create shame for people based on how they look, which is something yeah. we want to get rid of. So for someone like me who's on, on the left, my head just goes pop. Yeah, you don't know where to start. Smoking is, is a slam dunk. Don't smoke, you're a bell end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. End off, yeah. dickhead, don't smoke, stop costing me yeah, money yeah. on the NHS. But someone that might be overweight, it's very, very complex to understand why someone's overweight. It's, it's something I studied a lot, not because I've ever been overweight, but because I'm fascinated with biohacking and body and all of that. And I think the most, co co most illuminating thing I can tell anyone about being overweight 
is that eating too much does not make you overweight. This is, no one understands this. I'm going to blow your mind here. Being overweight causes you to eat too much. Once you have the metabolic condition of being overweight, that fucks your circuitry, which drives you to eat more. Obesity causes calorie surplus. So shaming people for eating too much is a waste of time because most people with busy lives and kids and no money are in a condition that's compelling them to eat more. It might be emo emotionally compounded, might be psychologically compounded. They might be recovering from abuse. They might be recovering from a bad relationship. They might just be skinned and can only afford fucking nuggets and they're, they're just tired. They're not getting enough sleep. And unfortunately, until you get into um, a low fat state like us, where it's easy to regulate your calorie, your, every part of your body is telling you to feed this obesity. No one understands that. I've gone deep into the science. I'm not a scientist, so look it up for yourself before everyone starts trolling me saying literature degree boy. Mm -hmm. But as far as I understand the science, layman's cards on table, obesity causes overeating. Now that is just boom, but it helps us to be more, com as much as I agree with what you're saying, it just, it leavens more compassion into people's weight loss journey. Although you're yeah. absolutely correct. If you don't want to die of COVID and you don't want to cost the NHS money, getting in shape is one of the best ways to do it. But of course it's not easy. And I've I've had moments in my life where I've been most stressed and you, it's a downward cycle. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So you, you eat and then you, you require sugar more and it, sugar becomes this addictive thing in yes. my life. And it only happens to me when I'm stressed. Yep. So I'll have my little moments as a downward cycle in my health when there's a lot on my mind. And so, yeah, I mean, compassion is certainly incredibly important in that regard. What about more broadly? So to, outside of health, the topic of personal responsibility. I like it because it's controversial. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I discuss the nuance. You're trying to get us it. in the Daily Mail here. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> Me no, with I a just, little head. <laughs> head. <laughs> Fat people should pay for themselves. <laughs> No, I, no, just generally in your life and success and like um, what you can accomplish. The fortunate position I'm in, which is what I talked about in my last podcast, was because I came from like a very broke family where my mum can't read or write and I, I was born in Africa and uh, we didn't have anything, no Christmas, birthdays, holidays. My journey in life, people don't discredit it. They don't point at me and say, oh, you know, silver spoon, you yeah. can't fucking talk. Yeah, so I feel like I can have the conversation a little bit more about personal responsibility. Of course, I'm fucking incredibly lucky. Like, I didn't choose to be me. You know mm. what I mean? I didn't choose my parents or the the good and bad things that shaped me. Yeah. But I but I want to I want to have a conversation about personal responsibility as it relates to career success. And let's let's start with hard work. Cuz in our society right now there's two counter narratives. One is that don't work like incredibly hard you're going to burn out and you're going to have mental health problems. And the other is I've never met someone that sat here in front of me that doesn't work really fucking hard and I I did. <laughs> I don't know how I would have sat here without hard work and tremendous sacrifice. Well, first of all, we sort of already made the point that a lot of people are working hard at things they hate. Yeah. So working hard at things you dislike, hate, or find stressful will bring success and money, but at a cost. Working hard at things you love. I, I'm, I, got, I finished filming at midnight last night in Mason. I got in at half one. I had my dinner at two and I fell asleep at three. And I bounced out of bed this morning to come here to do a podcast for the price of a car. Why? Because I love what I do. Now, if I was had got in at three from working as a hospital porter uh, and had to get up to do another job, which was quite well paid this morning, but I hated it, I wouldn't be buzzing. And that's what releases the cortisol and the stress hormone into your body. So you can't compare, you're not comparing like and like, even though both people are working hard. You've even got people that might be barristers or, or doctors really well-paid professions, but find it stressful when they're burnt out and stuff. It's unlikely you and I will burn out because I'm like, what's next? And you're intrinsically motivated by, you've got a sense of control. Exactly. So that's, that's what I think that Interesting. I, I think we can, we can differentiate there on hard work straight away. So far, I'm more interested in the first thing you said about the, the join between people's origin story mm. and how much stick they get for the success they've got. Cause I'm, I have to phrase mine a lot more than you because I get put in with the silver spoon guys because I'm a, just a white, a white man. Male, yeah. So I, I'm not going to use real names here and I'm not going to use real jobs because I respect, my profession is so hard. I don't give a shit whether you're Prince Charles doing stand-up. Anyone who does stand-up, I just, it's so hard to stand up. 
Um, and I don't think an elite background helps you in stand up. Might help you in telly and production. Might help you on stage with a bucket of piss. <laughs> <through>. <laughs> But I've been told on more than one occasion, oh, we'd love, we'd love to we we'll book you for the X show, but we've already got Ollie, um, and so we we got Ollie. We can't have two. And I'm like, how how is how me to me and Ollie represent the same thing? I sometimes think, well, I've got more in common with. I could phone up. I don't know if you know who Judy Love is. She's I do, a yeah, comedian. She's a comedian yeah. I could phone up Judy now, and we could speak for an hour. But we both grew up same similar part of London, similar age similar family. Yes, she's got Jamaican stories, but I've got Essex stories. That's the only difference in our conversation. We come from the same place economically. We come, we're fighting the same fight. We're punching up from, when we never, no one would ever say that. I'll probably be in trouble for even saying that. That's the controversial thing for me to say. And it shouldn't be because if Corbyn and people like that have got it right, everyone who starts with what I call lower entitlement points, I've got a lot more entitlement points than a, a woman of colour, undoubtedly. But I've got less lot less entitlement points probably than a Ghanaian prince, right? Mm. So all the people that have got fuck all, uh, I'll start with, should link arms. Doesn't matter what gender you are, what colour you are, that would be powerful. I'm a bit nervous when we get carved up and we're a, people who start in life in a tower block, should that tower block should be united, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's the first point. But I do I do think you we get off we do get off lightly if we've got money, if we had a more council estate background. It's like a license to be okay with having money. Like I can wear my rolly by the pool when I'm in Ibiza because I sound common. Yeah. If I sounded posh, I probably would keep the brightling on. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's so true. I, one, of, one of my guests that I had on the podcast um, went to a very good school and um, is white and blonde and very pretty. And she basically can't give advice to anybody without the papers mm. smashing her or social media. In fact, there was a meme before, the week before she came on the podcast. There was a meme that went viral. I think it did 250,000 retweets when she, the day she released her book. And it was this, someone pinned someone up against a wall with a big trumpet. And it was like white privilege telling you how to, how to become rich. Like she is not allowed to give advice to anybody mm. because she's white and went to a good uh, Oxford. And we, how much good insight and business knowledge and whatever she's, do we lose? Like so many people went to Oxford and didn't build multi, multi-million pound, two multi-million pound companies. I still want to hear this from this person. If right? someone's offering you knowledge, she's not, it's not like she's telling you about her struggles. Uh, yeah. the other day, there was a queue in Waitrose and yeah. I just couldn't keep that. That would be the trumpet, <laughs> right? Yeah. She's trying to tell you how to build a business. So it doesn't matter where you, if you come from space, if you can make me money, tell me how if you can tell me how to start the next comedy streaming platform service where i own 40 percent of the shares yeah. i don't give a fuck if you've got a double first from cambridge mm. or whether you're one of the mandem i don't care show me where to show me how to do it you've got to have you've got to have an open uh, knowledge is 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 once it's out there is democratic the path to acquiring it is not um but there's no doubt about let's trying to stay on topic what you're saying about personal responsibility is I'm really split on this because I don't believe it's true that anyone with enough will and luck can make it. I think we're probably outliers and freaks and just wired a bit different and have got what it takes to push through. I think if enough blocks are in place, you're a single child of a drug using mum in a towel block and I am built of stronger stuff. So I've bounced through my childhood and I've come out the other side, but a lot of people aren't. If we were all born the same, then why aren't I playing basketball? Why am I not sp sprinting? Mm. Why am I not um, a maths scholar? You know, some of us are born genetically more equipped in other departments. I'm clearly a highly energetic person who's good at motivating themselves. Mm. Some part of that is inborn. I was like, I, I was like it as a baby before I could speak. You know, the other toddlers are like uh, dribbling on their mm. blocks, and I'm like, where the blocks at? So it's unfair for us to go if only uh, Neil at the top of the tower block could have been like us. He too could have, have been an entrepreneur because maybe he, just being a single mum, being of colour or being transgender or being, not everyone has the strength to push through those things. Mm. Not everyone does. And it's unfair to go up to a wheelchair and go, just stand, mate. I'm using willpower with my legs. Why can't mm. you? Because some people... That, that is a wheelchair, their social background, and they don't have the strength and then they start using drugs and they just sink too low. Not everyone can pull themselves out. So that's why we do need more equality.
Yeah, I agree. I'm definitely pro equality. I, I, there's a sense of helplessness I get if I like, if I go all the way and say, you know, successful people, well, they were born with something. Yeah. It creates a sense of like, well, then you're, we're all just stuck in our lanes forever. And yeah. if I believe that when I was shoplifting pizzas in Manchester, <laughs> but then again, so what I do understand, I actually, when I, ref the harder I reflect, I basically give myself credit for nothing because I was born into a situation in a country. I actually think my bad experiences are why I'm here. Like the mm, fact that my parents same. weren't around at 10 years old, created this big gap of independence, et cetera, et cetera. I've told this story a million times, but it's the bad shit that is the reason that I became an outlier, I think. Mm -hmm. I became very obsessive, obsessed with money. My book, that's why it's called Happy Sexy Millionaire because it's the first page of my diary when I was like a kid. I want to be a happy, why did I want to be a happy sexy millionaire? Because we were fucking broke. Have you got siblings though? Yeah, I've got three. So are they, are they all happy thing. sexy millionaires? Not one of them. None of them are like me. And they don't understand me either. They look at me and like scratch their head. But what like, does that tell you? It's, it's almost like you've run a controlled experiment. Exactly. So tuning out um, genetics versus willpower. I, the, the difference between my childhood experience and theirs was they were raised by parents and I basically wasn't. Mm. So by, I was the youngest. So by the age, age of, I was 10, my parents were like, oh, we've done parenting now. We will work all the time and we will be out of the house when Steve comes home and we'll be out the house when he wakes up. So I was the only one where the, the experiment was total independence. So thought experiment for you. If you'd have been born a fraternal twin, another yeah. boy. Yeah. So, so as, as much your brother as your other brothers, but happen to be born at the same time, same conditions, same school, everything happens. So do you believe you would have another happy, sexy millionaire living in the flat opposite? Or do you think, depends what that brother's personality was like? Because we both know that that brother's personality is what would have decided whether he sat at this table with us today or not. And personality does come into it. We are born with different personalities to an extent. Mm. So I'm not saying we're all stuck in our lanes. But I'm saying we need more social mechanisms because some Einsteins don't have energy. Some Einsteins might, might be a bit emotionally weaker. So we're mm. say in my example of Neil at the top of the tower block, he might be really fucking amazing. We'll never harvest that talent because our society is set up with too many blocks in place to scoop it out. We had one thing in place for about 40 years called grammar schools. Mm. Very controversial, very unfair, dumping a load of 11 year olds in the thick bin. My mum went to a secondary modern. My dad went to a secondary modern. My wife, my brother-in-law, my mother-in-law and father-in-law all went to secondary moderns. So I know people who were told, you're no good at 11. So I don't say this lightly and I know how horrific that is, but the data does suggest that there was a short period where we scooped off some bright, poorer children, not necessarily Neil in the tower block, but at least the poorer children whose parents meant well but were were too poor we got them we got more einsteins mm. when you watch question time switch it on and you know i went to a state school and they're giving it all that it will always be a grammar school always it's very rarely i went to the local comprehensive and now i'm an mp it's always i went to a state which state school it's grammar school you went to an elite education then state but elite selective mm. so we need some more stuff like that uh, what can we do in our communities what can our youth workers do what what can we set up in 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 council estates headhunters that look for talent particularly boys i'm going to say that because i was a boy once but there's a real problem with teenage boys all this testosterone kicks in and it goes the wrong way for most of us you when i came on your podcast you ask very controversial questions i think you like those questions those are the ones that are most interesting to you aren't they yeah well i, I yeah as long as i don't get in trouble <laughs> well it's hard to tell <laughs> hindsight's a wonderful thing um so I guess my, I was just thinking then, this is a controversial question, but he asked me controversial questions. So I can ask him. Is there no hope for some people? What, I, give me, so zoom out context. Mm. Got a friend, tried really hard to help them change their life or do something for themselves. 10 years of effort, made all the offers in the world to this person. Still job seekers allowance, you know, some, somewhat depressed, can't seem to have any impact. We grew up in the same street. We were best friends my whole childhood. I went off, he stayed there. I've got tons of examples like that. So I have to speak very euphemistically now. I'll be cancelled, not by the internet, but by my <laughs> friends and family, stroke, associate, stroke. I don't even want to say which group these people are in. <laughs> uh, I've, all of this. I've had female friends who I'm like, stop dating bastards. And the next guy, he's nice. He is a coke dealer. And he's like, he's going to fucking, he's clear. He's going to shag your mate. <laughs> and then some of these women are getting to 35, you know, like with the final 
egg in the goblet like an Indiana Jones waiting to be fertilised. And um, this, the next guy, he's got, we've got three kids by three different women. He has, he's got an electronic tag, but it's great because we can spend some time in it. <laughs> Just bang a boring guy or a guy that likes Dungeons and Dragons or an accountant. <laughs> what they can't, There's a sexual attraction there to bastard men that some women, particularly from my sort of background, working class women, find hard to get over would be one example. But you can get over it. It is possible to do it. The mistake people like you and I make is we try to help and say you've got a friend who's unmotivated, depressed, leaves every job after three months. It's always someone else's fault. It's always the system. It's always, if only Corbyn was in power, it's uh, my dad did this, my mum did that. Always putting it on someone else. And then the, you're making it worse by putting it on you. Let me help. You're just a positive version of that. The solution is the, they have to switch the light bulb on in themselves. They may not get there. But the moment they wake up and go, today's the day I'm going to try and change my life, they should, they, that's the first step. It might be speaking to a therapist. It might be changing your career. It might be enrolling in A-levels that you do at nighttime, like I did. That was what, lucky enough, my revelation came up when I was 18. Did you were on Job Seekers Allowance at one point? I was, yeah. I did my A-levels late because I had this spark moment. But it's got to come from within them. It's not something as yet, although science might get there one day, that we can give to you in a pill or a, an injection. You've got to suddenly have, in, right back to the beginning of the chat, insight and be like, boom, chest out. I'm going to see a therapist. I'm not going to use negative language. I'm going to get this self-help book, which which gives me some CB, cognitive behavioural therapy tools. I always mangle up with cannabis, with <laughs> CBT. <cognitive> CBT. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's got to come from them. But for you and I, fixes how can we solve it how can i redraft the copy what's the solution unfortunately the solution is trying to get them to have some insight so if you have got a friend like that maybe have that sort of conversation with them that spurs self-reflection because giving them a million pound a year job is just going to make them worse because that muscle that's atrophied mm. will stay atrophied that sort of standing up making your own strength muscle I've been on my Huel journey for a couple of years now, but in the case of some of my best friends who I've talked about on this podcast before, one particular friend called Ashley Jones, who knows that I talk about him and his transformation story, he did have a problem eating certain foods. And so he transitioned to making Huel a greater part of his diet. And the guy went from being, and I'm sorry, Ash, if you're listening, the guy went from being like slightly overweight, constantly um, having health issues that are unrelated to like, you know, being slightly overweight, to be to literally having a six pack, posting his six pack on Instagram, but more importantly, being high energy and feeling amazing. So when I'm like, you know, talking to you guys about Huel, I do so with such a level of passion because I believe that it can really help change your lives in a significant way. I believe it can make you mentally better. I know it can make you physically better. And so, yeah, what a joy it is to have a sponsor that you believe in that much. Um, yeah, and they're also just really good people. One of the most, um, probably scary things from my perspective that you ever did was walking out on stage for the first time for yes. your first gig ever. Like, what the fuck were you thinking? Hmm. Going out and walking in front of people and telling fucking jokes, are you sure? Like, <laughs> it, With me, it's even more complex because I don't know if you've had any stand-ups on here before. Never. But the majority of them, and quite rightly so, will be like, from a young age, I used to watch blah, blah, blah on TV. I used to watch all these American comics. Uh, I used to watch Chris Rock, Bill Burr, mm. Bill Hicks. I knew that's what I wanted to do, man. <laughs> uh, I was like, you know, I was like the young boxer in the alleyway. I knew I was going to box. None of that. Nothing. There is zero in my CV that shows an affinity for the craft of stand-up. Always been the joker. I'm not being funny today. I don't know why it's, you got me on one. But normally I'm always asking around. Not This is not a thing I do on stage. I'm just, I'm like, like the clown person. Why? Just just my, that again, I've just always been, I just love making people laugh. I've always been a, a joker. There's some data to suggest um, youngest children have it. And I'm not the youngest child, the oldest, or people born in August and July, purely because if you're smaller than everyone else, You've got to develop your personality quick. So you, if you look at the premiership, you won't find many footballers born in August. I'll explain why I never made it. August. August 26th. So you won't find- 26th as well. You won't find many sportsmen or anyone that requires size or physical prowess, those professions. 
So even if you turn out to be a very tall teenager, you're less likely to become a basketball player than a, a teenager one inch shorter than you who was born in October. The reason being, you'd have been pushed by the coach and taught and everything early doors at six, seven, eight years old. So, and there is some data to suggest that people who work with their personalities for a living, people that have to solve entrepreneurs and find little rat runs and alleyways, develop that based on being smaller or more vulnerable. But that could take lots of forms. I've got an overbearing dad as well. So I'm an August baby, overbearing dad. And some of it will be genetic. My mum's very funny. And you, uh, you talked a little bit about, I was reading some, some of your um, previous interviews, you talked a little bit about how it was a bit of a defense mechanism maybe in school. If that's how, you found that's your I mean, place yeah. by being a... Yeah, I wasn't, but I, but I don't know how I wasn't bullied, but I, but I wasn't. The smallest, no girlfriend, um, wasn't in with the in crowd at all. I was sort of like an ex, in, a, in a sort of external group that had diplomatic immunity. Definitely virgin, definitely no cool friends. Definitely one of the idiots, but we don't punch him because he's sort of all right. Obviously, I did get, as a working class school, I yeah, did yeah. get punched, punched a lot, but not as much as. <laughs> I was in that league, you probably won't even remember them, just above the bullied, the boring grey league. Yeah, don't, you know? no, no point. Yeah. yeah, which is the place to be at school. Because if you're popular at school, we all know you're going to have a shit life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be um, the promo, just like, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, so because of where I grew up, it's not, people are like, well, how can you have no contact with stand-ups? You've got to remember my age. I know I look young, young for my age. I'm 45. So what was my dad watching on TV? Jim Davison, Bernard Manning, Jimmy Jones. It's like Bruce Forsyth and Jimmy Tarbuck, you know, live at the Palladium and all that. It's not, obviously they're all talented comedians. And I do, I do mean that, but it just didn't resonate with what, it's not, it's not about my life. So I'd, la I'd laugh because my dad was laughing. But I was like, what's this crazy art form? I've got to learn more. Me and my friends, mostly either smoking, it's all about getting high, or we'd watch old young ones or whatever the funny sitcom of the day was, men behaving badly or whatever it was. That's what I thought comedy was. No, we didn't go to the theatre at the weekend. We didn't like, mm. which cultural pursuit <laughs> shall we do this weekend, family? It was like, dad works all week, he's tired. We have a curry, your nan looks after you. And then when you get to 15, 16, you get stoned over the park, get someone pregnant, work in a shop, die. That's it. That's the finish line. So I managed to, like I say, have this weird entrepreneur turn my life around, get my first class degree moment. But just by sheer bad luck, I ended up at a university that did not have a stand-up night. Most of them do. Mm. So again, I went those three years without any exposure to in the student bar stand-up. It was all music. There was some theatre. No one talked about stand-up. We didn't have this sort of slightly fashionable thing now of being obsessed with American stand-ups. I like to say to my British colleagues, just remember it. If you start having this sort of slick quality to your stand-up, it can look a bit mannered. Um, that's just a side point. So I went all the way to the office to my dream job as an advertising copywriter with no contact with stand-up, just being funny as fuck, the clown, you know, legend on a night out, <laughs> first one up dancing. But I didn't know that that was something you could do for a living. And I ended up doing a job I loved, branding, copywriting, headlines. I still love it. You can tell by the way I'm describing it. And then the creative planner was like, you're always the one up at the pitches. You, I, I would do like, if we're pitching to a big client, I would do like the, the funny bit with interaction bits, to get yeah, them yeah. on side when I'm presenting the creative. He said, why don't you try stand up? Stephen Workman, if you're watching, thank you. Um, why do you just try stand up? You mind, he's close region. And I thought, do you know what? Do it once, like doing a bungee jump or a skydive or karaoke. It's just, that's as far as my thinking went. Something to tell the kids. So I wrote a few ideas down in a book, booked an open spot in, and I went and did it. It was very scary. I think I did a pack of Imodium before I went on. And my hand was shaking. And I got that, it wasn't, obviously wasn't great, but I did well ish, well ish. First laugh was like someone stuck cocaine, heroin, ketamine, everything in my, no, not that I've done those drugs, but everything in my veins. And I was hooked in, a, in the proper sense of that it fucked my life. Everything fell apart like a junkie. How can I get more of that? I want to gig three nights. I want to gig five nights a week for no money. I've got a creative director. We're talking about multi, multi million pound accounts. Advertising is you work till 8 p.m. You have pizza on your birthday under your table. You sleep at the office. I'm running off to do unpaid gigs in Manchester. My relationship with my girlfriend fell apart. My bills started to not be paid. I started to look thin because I suffered with my nerves in the beginning. I'm throwing up shit, like both ends. 
it's the closest thing to a drug addiction that I've ever experienced. I would have not seen my mum for a year to chase this dream. It was, I was hooked with on that laugh. I'm like, this is what I'm born to do. I just fucking know it. How can I monetize it, basically? How, why were you hooked on the laugh? Why did the laugh matter so much to just you? It's a rush. It's a, it's a rush. Anyone is, I've, I've not taken any serious drugs, but anyone that's taken any recreational drugs, which is a bad analogy because they're not actually addictive. But coffee, for example, I can't live my life without without it. Why are you addicted? It's, it's a, as absurd as asking me why I'm addicted to coffee. Because I go, I wake up, I feel alive and I have an amazing day. The same. Laugh goes in, buzz, uh, serotonin, pupils dilated. Afterwards, I want to tell everyone about the gig. I was taking shit footage into work and showing it to people and playing it in the office. Look at me. That's me. Look, look at, come and look at me, this grainy footage. In the, I mean, that's so embarrassing that I did that. Uh, I, just, I couldn't. I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe I was getting laughs from strangers. It was it's straight to the ego, straight to the cortex. Everyone rush. has that. But do you, do, have you ever considered that you might have, that might have mattered more to you, maybe because of your childhood or whatever, than other people? That that sense of like, that validation and that. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I'd had plenty of validation at work. I'd had the whole office cheer. I've rung the bell when we've won big pitches. I've got the rush in the meeting, but it, nothing were. It, it's the difference. I'm trying not to talk about drugs all the time. It, it, it's the difference between going from a beer to M MDMA, right? I don't recommend any dr hard drugs, obviously, particularly people that work with their brains. You're a fool if you mess with the equipment, but you can't compare them. When you say everyone has that, not everyone stood on stage to a thousand people and seen people standing and clapping. That is different. It's of a different category of ego rush very dangerous what problems does it give you well what, initially what all of come with it so you initially that my, my life fell my life fell apart like a junkies i was down to 10 stone at one point um so it come to the point where i had to say this needs to not be a drug this needs to be a food and i left the agency and then i was you know off still today though right so all all things come with their their costs. What is the cost today of that that career and that rush and that? I suppose the worst thing is the travel. That is a genuine negative one. Since Min has been born, my daughter, um, I actually quite like traveling. I like being in the back of a car. I love watching movies. I love reading and I love eating on the move. So all the things that most people hate, I just happen to quite enjoy. Just pure, I don't know why. Because I'm always on the go. I like being forced to sit still mm. and watch a movie. So I love flights, for example. The longer, the better. Um, Do you still shit yourself now when you get when you're about to? Yes, yeah, big time. But so far as so far as missing part of your child growing, massive negative. Doing a tour is there's all, there's a guilt thing in your gut, and you know you do cry a bit after FaceTime, and that particularly when it's a baby. So that's the biggest negative I can think of. But once you're with a woman or a man, that gets it there's no negative in your relationship i was with a couple of girls before who would make me feel bad about being away whereas Lindsay's kicking me out the door she's focused on the business we're a team that's well paid fuck off see you later don't call home if you're stressed i'm cool with it that's what you need man you need someone who gets it i do shit myself though still yes do you know when do you know the the, the um a modium scale goes up depending on how much of my show it is. So if you'd booked a show for me today where you're going to introduce me and I'm going to do 20 minutes stand up and you've got 2000 people in the room, there would be nerves there, a fair bit of nerves, but mostly I'm ready to knock the gig the fuck out with my first punch. If you've put an event on and Michael McIntyre's closing and you're hosting it and you to me at the last minute said, Russ, I've decided to do two halves. Can you do 20 minutes at the top? I'd shit myself because they're not there for me. They're there for you and him. And I've got a conversion job to do. Right. And the risk is massive. Mm. They're Michael's fans, they're your fans. And that's when the nerves kick in, when I'm doing Royal Variety Show or Live at the Apollo, where people have responded to a TV ticket, not me. That's when the nerves go back to old school style nerves. How, how do you, uh, what's the battle you have with those nerves and in terms of your cognition and before you go on stage, what are the tips you can give people? There's a lot right. of people. There's two, there's two ways to, 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 to work on that. Um, the first thing is the actual practical thing on the night, I would say, um, just work with breathing and mindfulness and all the stuff you've probably read a thousand times. The other thing to do is if you can 
find a way to do it. It depends which stage of your career you're at. If you're at the stage of the career like me and you, a lot of I'm not trying to be offensive. A lot of people are sucking our dicks a lot of the time. So we're constantly walking into the rooms where people think we're legends. And it's never going to be a difficult gig. Now and again, something comes up where you're the tadpole and you, you, you don't have the hardware in place and a fucking a Bill Gates is speaking before you, Oprah's mm. hosting it. And all of a sudden you're, who's this guy? You're having a day of who's this guy. We're all, we can all have a who's this guy day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the only way to practice that is to put yourself in more, who's this guy moments regularly. So how I do that, as soon as my tour finishes, I book the smallest, hardest, weirdest, they might have bad lighting, they might have no microphone, they might be half sold and I'm unlisted. Unlisted, unannounced, unexpected. And I'll walk on to tiny clubs full of drunk men, 50 year old UKIP dads, all of those places. I put myself in those all the time because the risk is high, the nerves are the same, but the consequence is at zero. So I'm constantly training the muscle of convert the people who don't know who I am, mm. keeping it sharp the whole time. So whatever business you're in, you'll be able to think of an equivalent way of doing that. So set up smaller situations where you're having to keep that muscle because the danger is the more successful you get, you lose the muscle of walking into a room full of skeptics. And if you lose that muscle, that's the money making muscle. So practice it. I keep mine tight at all times. I constantly put myself in unbuilt, unlisted, unideal situations. When you walk onto a stage, when you're at my level, which I would call myself quite recognisable. You can't say I'm like my, Michael McIntyre or Chris Rock or someone, but I'm sort of known as a stand-up. So what that means is when I walk on stage at the comedy store, late show, 400 people, drunk off their tits, work do's, hen do's, and I'm un unbilled, unexpected, unlisted, the room splits into three straight away. It splits into, oh my God, it's him. Fucking what a treat. We've got him for 20 quid. To the middle, who's that? Am I supposed to know who that is? Is he good? I don't know. I think I've seen him. And the final group, can't stand this cunt. <laughs> uh, that's the only group I'm playing to when a little bit in the middle group. They're the only people I'm interested in because that's where the muscle building exercise is. And then when you go on stage to your audience, they get you like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you come with that conversion energy to your own audience, you must be... You, must you don't be need it. That's yeah. the problem. Oh, yeah, All you got to do yeah. is put your foot out. And they're like, it's his foot. He's amazing. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem. You get flabby easy in all businesses. So you talked about your relationships there and your current partner. I, um, I heard you got married for nine months. At one oh, point. yes. Yeah, no, I did. <laughs> You'd forgotten. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, sorry, I realised what you mean. Yeah, no, I did. I was, I was married. Bef I was married, but so I'm, I'm currently, I'm trying to enjoy my middle marriage. That's what I say okay, to them. Okay, right. <laughs> middle marriage. Okay. No, I was. Uh, so we, we were just, we realised we were just mates. Uh, yeah, there was a romance there. We had a lot in common. We were both into this same world, and we were sort of living together. And we got married, and we were like, that was a mistake. And then we just weren't married. It was, and it was totally amicable. No, no fighting. No, no problems at all. But you talked about the uh, understanding that your current partner has, current wife. Yeah. So my, my former partner, the, the one I was married to for nine months, had that as well, which is why it was so we thought we should probably get married, but we realised marriage needs more than that. Um, so yeah, so Lindsay is more, Lindsay doesn't get jealous unless I do something dickhead, like follow a glamour model and instead and like a bikini pic, which I get my ass kicked, but still do because I'm Neanderthal. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm a man, the oh, monkey yeah, press button, good. can't help it. Um, so unless I do something stupid like that, which I rightly get in trouble for, or like change my flight in Ibiza and go to a boat party, which I also tried to do and got my ass kicked for. Um, so, but my, if I'm on the road and doing autographs afterwards and there's all uh, girls in the picture or something, I've never ever, like Lindsay's just not even a flicker. She gets it. That's the job is every, you're everyone's friend. If the girls fancy you in the audience, even better. That means another Maldives holiday type thing. That's the way she's in business mode. She is an on, a, a bit of an entrepreneur, Lindsay. She's got two businesses and she sees my business as a business. Um, and she never, ever guilts me over being, I might be away for four nights. I won't, some days I've gone, shit, I didn't phone home. I didn't text. I didn't even, as, now and again, all I have to do is do a good night. And she knows that my head might be full. And there's never any fallout, never. And that just makes the trust and the bonds. It's just, of course, I then do call home. It just works because of that. 
you're someone that will get a lot of attention because it's, I mean, it's your job, right? It's yeah. like to, keep, to hold in, keep Literally attention. to seek attention is my yeah. job. And, and women, they love funny guys, right? So oh God. you know, probably, I don't know if this is going to get in trouble, but you know that you could have a lot of different Mate. partners if you wanted to. I could be harvesting 24 <laughs> seven. That's what I mean. So I probably would have fractured pelvis by now if I hadn't got married. People are going to hate this question because they think I'm encouraging it, but I'm here to play devil's advocate, yeah. okay? Why aren't you? Well, um, I fell deeply in love and got married. And I'm just, again, you go back to the childhood, undivorced parents. It's just what I modelled on. It's, I've never had a problem with saying to a girl, um, the relationship's done, my head's starting to be turned, let's move on. And as much as it breaks my heart, if I ever felt that way, I would, obviously with a marriage and a child, I would sit down to, to, to Lindsay and say, there's an issue here. I've started to have these thoughts. How can we work on it? And we'd, we'd work something out. So that's just my way I operate. Hardly any men do. Sorry, girls, for my, for my sex. If well. only men did. I mean, but they don't. So I'm trying to, a man should go, I haven't done anything, but I'm having these thoughts. What does it mean? Does it mean we're not in love? Does it mean sexually our relationship's not exciting? Is there something we can do that, some games we can play to mimic that? I don't know, whatever. A couples need to just have that conversation because if you pretend men and women aren't having those thoughts, you're naive. So you need to keep the relationship alive. That's the way to do, to do it. Why, why am I married? Well, A, I'm 45, remember? Uh, and B, I, I'd, I'd been, I'm more serial monogamist so I'd gone from age 16 to 30 odd be with a girl for three years break up get straight with another girl literally the next week break up on anywhere between nine months to three year relationships I'd never had a one night stand I'd never been single I'd never been on a lad's holiday so when I split up it's a bit weird but my mum was like you are not going to find a sustainable relationship because of all these reasons you said you're going to get a lot of female attention you're always going to wonder what it's like. She went, I was you, I'd have a year on your own. So I set the clock and I was like, Panani master in action. <laughs> and uh, we're not cynically, not cynically shagging. That's going to be the promo clip. <laughs> <laughs> but not cynically shagging, but being sing. it's more to, more to it than just shagging. It was like just being in a, living in a flat on your own. I bought a banging flat in London. One I've, I've still got. I use it as my London residence. And I just oh, thought- You've still got it? Yeah. Does your wife know? <laughs> well, we stay there all the time. Okay. And uh, she's, and I'm like, I can, I can come, I'm living, I've never lived on my own before. I'd always live with a woman, always live with a girl. And uh, it was just nice. I'd just be in my pajamas, have a curry. And then I could, I could, or I would, I would just think, I'm gonna go out on the pool after the gig. And that gets boring quick. Unless you've got some sort of, um, issue like sex edition issue and you're addicted to lots of different women i'm not that type of like dominant guy that needs to fuck a thousand women to prove i've walked the earth um i more without getting too personal i do enjoy i'm a highly sexed individual very unfortunately for lindy incredibly high sex drive like a 19 year old lad but it's sex i enjoy not conquering women so i can quench that thirst with one woman over and over again but i did want to know what it was like to you know to be single to be free and part of that i'm sure it's the same for a woman for a man is to go what's it like to have a one night stand or to be to be a have this rock star lifestyle and sleep with loads of women the difference i did it was if i was going out after a gig or if a girl had dm'd me and we were going out or whatever just missed tinder um <laughs> I would say, this is where I'm at. This is what I do for a living. I'm single. I, I'm, I, lo I do love making love and I love going out, but there is no relationship here. I would never went to bed with a woman dangling any fake carrots ever. I think it's a form of, I don't want to use language too strongly. There's a sort of con a consent tweak in there. If you're lying, if you're in a power position like me and saying to go, let's see where it goes, but you just want to fuck her. I think that's wrong. I think it's morally wrong. I think you should say, this is what it is. I want to party with you. Can you handle it? And newsflash, most women are looking for that too. So I had a wicked time for for a year. And then one of those girls was Lindsay. And it's just something different happened. And we saw we saw each other again and again and again, and then boom, married. I, I asked this question because I was, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine last night who's an entrepreneur and he's continually failed in marriage. And we were going back and forward 
about whether about the importance of meaningful relationships. And I was making the case that they're incredibly important. I sent him a TED talk about which shows that they did a study on men over, I think, about 100 years and showed that the men that were in committed relationships lived longer, mm-hmm. had way better health, were way happier. They studied men for 100 years. I think it's the only 100 year study they've done of, of this type. And he was basically saying, well, you know, women that, you know, they, they just don't understand that I'm ambitious and stuff. Wait, is he wrong? Is he right? How is he true. wrong? He's statistically right? true. And also people that believe in God live longer. I'm not a god I'm a total atheist <laughs> for you. I mean, that would be the curveball you weren't expecting. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Tell me about Jesus, Stephen. Now, uh, it's people that believe in God live longer. And um, so I think it's not the case that um, faith keeps you alive or that a relationship keeps you alive. As far as I understand the science, there's a neuroprotective and cardiovascular benefit of, of doing what we're doing today, just hanging out basically. And the most reliable way to hang out and check in with someone on a regular basis is to have someone you're married to. Are you okay? Take your stress levels down. Or even better, get together every Sunday with a bunch of people who actually give a shit about whether you're skinned, whether you've got cancer, whether your wife's left you, who are going to look out for you. And sadly, in our society, religion is the only thing that forces people on a Friday, Saturday or Sunday to get together. If you're going mosque every Friday, is it? If you're going mosque, if you're going mosque once a week and you're, you're praying next to that man next to you, he's probably going to notice if you're down. It's as simple as that. There's nothing magic about marriage, but the homo sapiens, I believe that our cortisol levels drop and our dopamine levels rise when someone gives a shit about us. Mm. It would make sense on an evolutionary level if you look at the way chimps are, that when one of them gets excluded from the group because they have a fight and they're going, you know, you see them on the documentary, they yeah, get a great yeah, yeah, yeah. They're <laughs> they never live long because why would you? Where is the evolutionary drive of your genes to pass seeds and eggs on if you're the type of person who can't bring the pack forward? So there would be a strong evolutionary argument for single people to die before attached people, for non-religious people to die before atheists. So atheists like us have to make sure we really have strong friendship groups. And I wish, wish, wish we could get humanism off the ground. Every Sunday there's readings, there's your, your local Richard Dawkins is doing a science reading. We all have a bit of tea and cake. Our kids all play together and then we all go home. Wouldn't that be amazing? And mm. Why doesn't it exist? It's it so would true. solve a lot of problems because we it pick up. So I, I, if you were depressed, I'd pick up on it if I was mm. seeing you every week. Everything you've said is backed by everything I've studied. And I've, I've wrote a chapter in my book called The Journey Back to Human, which describes this. It was inspired a lot by Johanna Hari, who wrote Lost Connections. Yes, I know you. And um, about getting back to our tribes. And when you look at the way we're living our lives it, today, it's, it's just yeah. the antithesis of human. And, right. re- and religion and relationship is the only way you can keep those human yeah, those elements human, in. Yeah. So far as your your friends who keep having failed marriages, m- marriages fail for lots of different reasons. So you, for, so for for men who keep getting into three year relationships and splitting up, if if it's the same reason every time, if the eye is roving. And he just wants to fuck other women. I mean, we need to speak about this in real language that men use. Sorry if you find it offensive, switch off. But a lot of the time, a man gets two, three years in, the novelty wears off, and he's like, I just, what's it going to be like? To, I want to yeah. fuck a different woman. The co- so the cost as well, the resistance or the uncomfortable yeah. parts of the relationship remain, yeah. but the upside decreases. If it's sex, a lot yeah. for a lot of men. Like, so oh, I feel so sorry for girls that, but why did, why did my man, she, what was it I wasn't doing? It's hard to face the fact that some men, maybe 60, 70% of men who split up with you, just want to shag someone else. It's Let's just put that on to, I'm sure many women, but I don't speak for women. So I'm not being sexist. I'm just not speaking for women. Let, get a woman on here. Ask her why she splits up with someone every three years. So you need to, if you're a man that has those urges, you need to find a, a woman that you can work with that can keep you sexually excited and do whatever you need to do. Just, you've got to do it. And uh, and you have you need a woman you can talk about those things with. And a lot of it can be uh, role-playing, verb, dirty talk, verbal fancies, whatever. These are practical tips. A lot of couples never cross these boundaries because they're too shy. You mm. split up with someone because you wanted, I don't know, to get dressed up as a policeman and pretend she was someone else and you were too cringe to tell her. But that could have been the thing that converted it. Mm. It could be as simple as as going to a club separately, dancing with, uh, with other people, then going home together at the end of the night. Have you tried... Until you have that conversation as a couple and admit you're having those thoughts, you will split up or worse, cheat and ruin that woman's life and ruin her faith in men.
or if you're, if you're anyone, I'm sure it's exactly the same if you're a gay gay man as well. You're, you're ruining that, that boy you've split up with. You're ruining his life. So far as what, why women split up with men, who knows? And that's not for me to say, but I do think a lot of the times we're reluctant to admit it's such a basic sexual reason. I, yeah. I, I suspect it is the case and we'll make any old shit. I just felt bored. We've grown apart. You know, I just wasn't, it will say any old shit just to not admit I like looking at girls on Instagram. I want to go on holiday on my own. Tough conversation to have, right? Because it's it feels like an attack on... But you build it in as fun. Yeah. You'd, be, you'd be like, it's three years in. I'm going to be straight with you. I really, really love you. As long as you love... If you don't love a girl, just tell her. You, you definitely need to split up. But if you love her, but have sexual urges, that is resolvable. Guys, I think, quite often, Hoochie, and this is a presumption, I don't know the truth, they will take the path of least, least resistance. So they look over at their partner and they think, if I have this conversation, this is going to blow up and she's going to scream in my face. I think I can just go and grab that apple without, exactly. without resistance. So they just reach out for the apple because that conversation yeah. feels like more psychological discomfort than... Yeah. I, don't, I just... I, don't, don't go shagging other people to end your, your relationship. We all do that. They we, literally cheat to end the relationship. We've all had moments, I have in past relationships where I've found myself in a bar contemplating it, talking to a girl. And as soon as that happens, I know. You know either I don't love this girl or something's going wrong in the bedroom. It's normally one of those things. Can you love someone and cheat? Hmm. Is well, the type of question you'd ask me? <laughs> probably, yes. Yeah, you think so? Probably. In the same in the same way, I I can adore my daughter and would die for her, but would I go and work on a project for a month with no phone contact at a pivotal development point of her life? Yes, I could, because I can compartmentalise. I imagine women are exactly the same. I, I, in fact, I suspect a woman can be profoundly in love with a man who's not giving her attention or making her feel special or sexually exciting her. And she can have sex with someone else, feel awful, and still profoundly love her husband. One of the things you said is you said you uh, you're forty five, mm -hmm. forty six when in yeah, August. August. Oh yeah, of course you're August baby. <laughs> August baby. Not long. You look about thirty one. Like if oh, you told to me hear. you were thirty one, thirty two, I'd probably believe you. Yeah. Um, how have you done that? So first of all, it's got me into trouble um, because what happened was when I started doing all this biohacking and stuff like that. What's biohacking? It's where your work, you're using the current science available to try and hack your own biology to survive on less sleep in a way that doesn't damage your health, for example. I've not cracked that one. To not lose your hair, working on that one. Or to slow down the aging process. So not so that you can live to 120, not that, it's a common misconception, but that so you can have the bit of your life between 30 and 70 in a more sustained younger state. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to have better middle age years, not be a 120 year old. What you'd like to be is a 120 year old that's like an 80 year old now. But what you're trying to do is stretch. Particularly, I did my first gig at 28. So I quickly realized I need to find some solutions here because I'm high energy Lee Evans act. I talk about my mum, my dad. I'm a late bloomer. I've got a what I'm going to, I would end up having a wife much younger than me. I need to have the body of a 30 year old man quick. So I started studying. I mean, I was 30 at the time, but you know what I mean? I need to yeah, keep yeah. it here. Um, so the trouble it got me into is when this stuff started to work, dramatically work, I would sit down in interviews like this with journalists and people would go, so how old are you, Russell? And I would say, oh, guess, trying to get a compliment. And they would all, they started to guess four years younger, five years younger, then 10 years younger, then 15 years younger, like you have today. And I thought, this is showbiz. Fuck that. I'm going to knock a few years off because this, the one prejudice people are still allowed to have, not book you because you're old. Can't wait till old life matters starts because I'm going to be fucking behind. <laughs> no, but seriously, why can we, why is it okay to make redundant and underpay and exclude people based on their chronological age? Mm. Uh, but that prejudice alive and well. Um, so I, I thought I lied. I lied my ass off. And of course, I was really unsophisticated about it. I was like celebrating my real birthday with comedians and friends and then lying to the observer or, or the mirror. How much did you lie by? Five years. Oh, not bad. I forgive you. Um, but in, So that was a story. That was a tabloid story in two newspapers. And I, and a lie, jokes were made on TV, a, a, a comedy award ceremony. So I was quite mocked for it. So as a comedian, Eminem, style i took that wrote a show about it called right man wrong age 
took it on tour, owned it. No one said a word since. And now I talk about it all the time. I think it's quite funny, really. It's quite human. I mean, what the fuck? If so, if I don't know what whatever the thing is in your profession, maybe it's it, age as well. It's been age for me. When I was eighteen, everyone wrote about me because I would like I'd made a hundred pounds when I was eighteen, and I realised that in my industry, your age and the achievement are the most important things. So when, if I was 18 and I'd made a hundred quid, they had me on BBC. This 18 year old's made a hundred quid. Right. And I realized that by, when I get to 25, I actually need to have made about a hundred million for them to consider me the same way. Yeah. So I'm like super slow to change my birthday every year. I'm like, oh, 27. I'm like, yeah. I need to be a billionaire. <laughs> like, yeah, right. So, but you know, from a business sense, it might be exaggerating turnover to seek investment yeah. then revealing real turnover afterwards. But it's, hey, okay, we're all millionaires anyway, that type of thing. So I was exaggerating turnover to attract investment. Um, but I didn't realise it was a, it's a massive issue because people come to stand up comedians for authenticity and realness, particularly my type of stand up. So anyway, I owned that, chucked it back. That's all good. How I've done it is just, there's loads of places you can go to. I started with Dave Asprey and, and Bulletproof and all of those things. Although I do think drinking butter is way over the top. But it's, it's moving towards a, a lower carb, not keto, nothing extreme. I don't believe in anything extreme that's hard to stick to. But certainly I don't believe we're supposed to eat white bread and cereal and shit like that. Working with what we're built to do would be the most basic way without spending money. Anyone that's watching this can start. We woke up on the savannah this morning, you and I. It's time to go hunting. There ain't going to be food there. We probably would have eaten at 2 p.m. No doubt about it. Human beings are built to have anywhere between 16 hour to two day fasting gaps. No doubt about it. Um, so, and sure enough, now we look at this on a cellular level, we can see what happens. So I ate at, um, last night I worked very late, so I didn't eat till nearly 11 p.m. By now, as I'm speaking to you, not only do I have an intense fucking focused high from only having had coffee and water, which has got to be a good thing, there's um, autophagy going on in my cells. So the, the cells are eating up their own bits of dead protein and shit just out of sheer desperation for something to eat. That's the first thing that happens. Apoptosis is the proper name for it. The cells, that the shit ones just die and burn off like the crust at the edge. If you pour food on the edge of that situation, as far as I understand the science, I'm sure people will refine what I'm saying. I'm trying to distill what I've learned for the layman. You you keep all that crap in. So unfortunately, we're pro fasting is brilliant. I don't buy into many fads, but the science here, you can see it under a microscope. So intermittent fasting and eating lower carb is something anyone can do. Someone on 10 grand a year can do that tomorrow. So eat more like leafy green vegetables. I think if you're on 10 grand a year, you are probably in yeah. <laughs> Exactly. But eat more leafy green vegetables. Breakfast is, I think, the easiest one to skip because you produce a hormone in the night that suppresses appetite anyway. Otherwise, you'd wake up hungry all night. If you are waking up hungry, your diet's fucked. Change it. So you don't, I won't wake up hungry. So we're brought up to wake up not hungry and eat a bowl of Cocoa Pops and then boom, the insulin goes up. Insulin, you don't want your insulin high. And the only way to do that is sugar and carbohydrate. So lower your carbohydrate, 100, 120 gram net a day. Anyone can do that. Still rice. If you like bread, eat bread, but eat wholemeal bread. That's the two most basic things you can do now. So far as the more intense chemicals, I can tell you what I'm on. I would take phytacin in the morning, which is a synolytic activator, something that's, that stops cell um, decrease and senescence, like aging in cells. Once a week, I will probably also take another synolytic activator, a chloroquine is called. I take PQQ every morning. That's the little pink one. I do take NMN, which is really expensive. But the, the life force in the cells that keep us going is called NADS, N-A-D. And that's what causes aging. Aging is not inevitable. It's your cells. We're, we're a combination of digital and analog information. So every time you rewrite a cell, it gets rewritten a little bit less well, and then you get wrinkles and gray hair and you start forgetting and you die. So if you can help the cells be more accurate in writing, you can stay younger, not just in how you look, but generally. So I do take NMN every day. And that's the big one. And that that is a precursor to creating NAD in the body. And I've def I mean, I have no Botox, I have no filler in my face. I do use stuff from boots and moisturizer and I do go for like a posh facial now and again, but there's nothing artificial in my skin. Um, this is a great point moment to cut to my podcast sponsor, NMN. <laughs> well, NMN's the drug. Loads of people make it. 
Okay. Um, if you're looking for a good one in the UK, go on Amazon. I think it's double wood is good. It's expensive though, man. You're looking at six pounds a day Ooh, for a sup. Expensive, yeah. Five, six pounds a day. But if you think, if you're spending, if you're lucky enough to be spending that on, on a coffee, take a flask, buy an MN instead. I bought, I bought my own coffee today. So what I will do is, the, my pet hate is watching uh, a video like this, listening to a podcast like this, and people not listing grams and brands afterwards. And all the top guys, David Sinclair's the guy you want to read, by the way. If you read one book, it will change your life. It's why we age and why we don't have to, David Sinclair. He does all the science, but he always refuses to give like geeky levels of endorsement on what I take because his inbox always crashes. So what I will do is I will... I will send you exactly what I take on a daily basis. You need to check with your physician your, and you need to make sure everything's right for you, obviously. But NMN is definitely the one that encourages NAD production and helps the cells copy themselves and slow down aging. Resveratrol, very, very, very important. So I take a, um, 750 milligrams of NMN and I take a gram of resveratrol every morning. Don't go on Amazon and buy resveratrol, the brown stuff. You need trans resveratrol, the ultra refined stuff. You need a gram of it a day. Vitafair is is a good brand. What about hair? Hair, they've still not- Starting to get greys. Yeah, they've still not solved why we go grey or because baldness is a genetic program that's running, like your height, it's harder to hack. It's to do with the, the testosterone hormone DHD that kicks in, DHT that kicks in. Um, so your body after a while and the way it synthesizes testosterone in the scalp causes the follicles to die and fall off. The only way to do that is to block DHT. But if you're a man, it's a two, it's a double-edged sword because if you start messing with your testosterone, you can lower your sex drive, lower your aggression. I need lots of aggression in what I do when I go on stage and for exercise and things. So I don't take things like um, finasteride, which we know works. Because I'd rather be Jason Statham, mm. uh, like bald and horny, than have loads of hair and a eunuch. That said, um, I am losing my hair at the crown. I have been for about two years. <clears throat> the reason you can't see it today as much as you could two years ago, I am using a derma roller. Um, you can buy these cheaply on Amazon. Make sure you buy one with individual titanium spikes. If it's boasting hundreds of titanium spikes, it's a shite one. It means they've got a rolled out bit of titanium. You want one, if it's plastic, it'll be about 190, 200 spikes titanium, and you'll be able to see each individual spike, 0.5 millimeter, once a day, roll, roll, roll. It's a little bit painful. Roll, 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 roll at the temples here. And then you would put on um, minoxidil, 15% ideally. Duogen's a good one. Again, very expensive. You're looking at 30, 40 quid a month. Um, but it works. What does it do? You start to get, first of all, little puby grey hairs and it just holds the wolf so you're not bald. You don't have like 17-year-old hair. Mm. But as you can see, I am no, I am not bald. Mm. Um, and that's all I do. I, the roller is, the roller's about, oh no, the roller's about a tenner. The minoxidil is expensive, but you can get like a, get it down to about £30 a month, but don't go below 15%. And if you really want to do belt and braces, how you shampoo is important. Get a really good caffeine shampoo, like Alpacin. And you want um, a brush like, it's like a round, really cheap round plastic brush with the plastic bristles, like boys would have gelled their hair with back in mm. the day. One of those. And when the shower, really scrub that shampoo in. And leave it for five minutes. So if you shave or you brush your teeth, go and have your toothbrush and you shave while the foam's there and then shower it out. How did you get into all of this? Was it that book? No, no, no. That's I've just re researched okay. myself, the optimal methods for hair regrowth. But for biohacking, I've used David Perlmutter, the uh, doctor, cardiovascular doctor about heart health and cholesterol and make, trying to learn the safety of going higher fat. I use Dave Asprey for a lot of the supplements, your PQQ and things like that. And on all the knowledge about high fat and biohacking and sleep and all that. And I use David Sinclair for the real, real hardcore science on life extension. It's a brilliant book. It's just about accessible for the main reader. But if you get into it, you love it. There's loads of stuff in there I don't do, like the cold showers and things like that. Oh, cold showers. Tell me about that. I've uh, I've heard about this, but I just don't have the guts mm. every day. It just feels like it will ruin my day. I mean, the most controversial thing about what I've said is I'm not recommending people go low carb. I'm just saying it's what I do. Mm -hmm. 
you might come from Australasia and you might have different genetics that mean you, if you eat a high fat diet, it's incredibly dangerous. Check what your doctor recommends. Go and do your own research. Go to Atlas Biomed where you can get your own biome sequence by sending a bit of poo through the post. It's fascinating. And they send back your whole internal microbiome. Get your cholesterol tested three months in, six months in. See what it's doing. My cholesterol, of course, is off the fucking charts, but so is my HDL cholesterol, meaning my cholesterol ratio is good. Do I have plaques in my arteries? Yes, I do. I've run a CT scan. Um, so you could need to take your own call on that. I mean, if you're a student and you get hit by a car and you're 18 years old and we do an autopsy, you will have plaque in your arteries. Babies have plaque in their arteries. We all have plaque in our arteries. I remain to be convinced that the fact I have cholesterol running around my blood actually is the thing that makes the plaque cholesterol. That I'm in a minority. I'm not medically trained. I could be talking shit and I'll, I could be in the, a coffin when I'm 60, but I'm fascinated by it. I'm a layman. I'm on a journey. You do your own reading. The NHS recommendation certainly isn't to eat high fat, but I just don't buy the science. It, it stinks to me. So, and plus I just, I'm going on how I feel. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's probably the most important way. Um, your podcast, you have a, a, a podcast which um, talks a lot about cancel culture. Yes. What's um, what's going on in our society at the moment in terms of cancel culture? It seems to be getting much more, uh, maybe because of algorithms and we're, we're separate, you know, we're creating these echo chambers and we're defining, you know, this side is you know, left and this is right and there's nothing in the middle, but what's going on within society? And uh, I guess the question I'm going to come to eventually is how do, how do we fix it and can we fix it? Mm. Or are we fucked? I think we're probably a little bit fucked for the time being because after loads of historic injustice and inequality and, and I hate the word woke, I don't, I almost don't want to be woke because it's such a cunty word. Mm -hmm. um, I just think waking up to things you've not seen before. The word woke's become politicised, so I reject it as a term. But we, we need to swing the barometer a little bit this way until everyone's being represented properly. Then it will settle probably in our children's generation. It will settle. So stop panicking Gary, Dave Lee and everyone with a, a Union Jack profile. It will it will settle. Um, what I find frustrating and toxic is we're living in a culture where you can be cancelled overnight. Ant Middleton, cancelled overnight. Sharon Osbourne, cancelled overnight. It doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, what colour, what gender you are, you are at risk. No one is safe. Trust me. Especially white men. Well, anyone really. I remember, um, I don't even know if I want to put it back out there, but I'm, no Reggie hates of it. And he, he said something mm -hmm. about Jewish music producers. Yeah, yeah, I remember, yeah. Just about survived that. So I, I, I don't think anyone, I think any, in fact, I think it's probably worse if you're of colour because the right will be ready. They'll be fucking ready. See, fucking see. So I would actually say no. I would say, I think everyone's at risk from this. It's a rabid, oh, we got one of them, particularly a lefty and, and cancelled them. How can we live in a culture of instant, pardon, black, I shouldn't say black and white after what you said, but instant black and white cancelling where you can wake up in the morning and be gone that at the same time exists alongside, how dare you use a label? Nothing has meaning. We're in a postmodern world of amorphous fog where we don't even have pronouns. Nothing's real. History is not real. The things you've learned aren't real. Literature isn't literature. Nothing has a label. No, you're cancelled. And I'm sure. What? Yeah. <laughs> well, which is it? Are, are we in a postmodern, nothing means anything, everything's up for grabs, shifting meaning, diverse culture, which sounds quite exciting to me as a comedian. Yeah. Or are we in a Nazi Germany executed the next morning? Both of those two together, head fuck. I have this tweet saved in my drafts on Twitter and it says, and I didn't tweet it because I didn't have the nuts, right? Because I was being, I was like low key being cancelled for something I said at the time. So I thought I'll just stagger this one out. But it says the left will allow you to be non-binary and everything but your opinion. Right. And it's kind of what you're saying there. It's like, we've got to the point where we understand things aren't binary, mm. right? In sexuality and other points. But my opinion has to be. Like if, my, if the stance I take on Black Lives Matter doesn't perfectly, I don't look like I'm wearing, like as I said in the last podcast with Anne, the football kit, shoes, socks, shirt, then I am definitely of the right and I should be treated as such. Yeah. And I, I, I had it quite recently with the um, the uh, Sarah Everett, uh, Everett tra tragedy because 
I made the point that the narrative, and this is this key sentence that I just, social media just didn't allow me to express, then which narrative is most helpful and productive in creating the shift we need to see in male behavior? Which narrative? Mm. Is it the narrative that, um, which which I saw a lot of, which is it's it, all men, all men? Are the are the the problem? Is that the narrative which is most helpful mm. and productive? Mm. And so the the conversation I was trying to have it's is a real politic. What works in the real world? Yeah, I'm not saying there's not a fucking problem with men, or yeah. they're not pigs, or there's not like the patriarchy, or there's not misogyny. The stats say that. I, I'm not the stats. The stats mm. say 97 of young women have experienced some form of sexual abuse or harassment. My, my, my point is about the which narrative is most productive and yeah. helpful. You're a businessman. You're like, which model can we employ to get the best profit? Yeah, because I, I, I reflect. I say, when, when, Tommy, when Tommy Robinson ran around saying, okay, it's not all Muslims, but it's always Muslims that are blowing up buildings, whatever, we would run them out of town because that's a deeply toxic way yeah. to think, right? Yeah. And it's the same with black people. Like We get, you know, locked up more. So asserting that, you know, it's not all black people, but it's some black people. Therefore, the fear is all black people. The way that I got to my logic, I was like, I have two nieces who are going to go into the world who I love dearly. What would I say to them? They're four years old and three years old. What advice would I say to them to help them, mm. A, guard against predatory male behavior, but also to help them in their life be productive and to work with 50% of the population? It definitely wouldn't be, Alessi, right? Sit down. You're going to have to fear all men. That some of them, the threat, Alessi, is my niece, is all men. That's not, for me, wouldn't yeah. be a... Imagine the damage I would do to yeah. my niece. I mean, I don't know what to say. You've put it brilliantly. I, I, it is, I got finished off. I got yeah. finished so badly on Instagram. I was fucking... I, they finished me. It's because part of the problem is having a discussion like this when a girl has just died. If you and yeah, I to have this right. at a university in two years time, it's a quite an interesting, yeah. it's a very interesting conversation that needs to be had. So I did do a stand up response to it. I did a one minute thing, but I waited 10 days. Smart. But I waited yeah. 10 days and then I did a rant about, um, why do we teach sex education so late? Why do we teach consent so late? And I, and I just made fun of the British education system not speaking to teenagers about sex enough because I think that's what the issue is. Um, we don't teach our but all boys, whether they're whether they're predatory boys or not. Men aren't taught about sex early enough. Mm -hmm. From angels to sex offenders, they should be taught in primary school. Not from porn. No, exactly. That's where the problem is. Um, but yeah, so I think sometimes having, trying to have a, con I, I, I do actually dis disagree slightly with one of the things you said right at the top, which was when you said, oh, um, I need to have a binary opinion, but, but not have a, a binary sexuality because I, I do think, no, you can have a non-binary opinion. I, we could be talking about Jane Austen and literature and we can say, yeah, but it, I can't think of a subject you and I can can't, can have a conversation on where fashionable postmodernism, nothing means anything, doesn't apply. On a major issue, we, like Black Lives Matter. Yeah, we could talk. We could we could talk. We could talk about. Now we're not we're not going to say whether Black Lives Matter or not, but we could have a discussion about race. Does race exist uh, on a genetic level? We proved that it doesn't. So what is race? Does race? We, we could we could chat, and everyone could leave the lecture going, I don't know what to think. In and a next, lecture uh, or face to face, or, or we could we could broadcast it now. Talk, talk about race. 100%. Talk about does race exist? And this is why I love podcasts, because you get context and nuance. 180 characters in the middle of the Black Lives Matter. You, Russell, why haven't you posted the black tile? You can't that. go, well, does race exist? People will go, racist! Silence yeah. is violence. But you could still, but what I mean is we can be postmodern fluffy and not say anything, almost about anything, but we still be cancelled at the same time. Now, those two things are both quite extreme. Yeah. I mean, they're opposites. And that's making, that's clo can close down debate and hamstrung people. I like my um, offensive people where I can hear them. I don't like them on WhatsApp groups hidden. Mm. I was never against um, Nick Griffin of the BNP going on Question Time. I, I don't mind putting that out there. A lot of people say, you put him on there, you legitimise his views. What actually happened? He looked like a total cock and now he's disappeared. Have the courage to know. Like, I do think there is good and bad. I don't think right-wing people are bad and left-wing people are good. In fact, I think it's just as many cocks across the spectrum. I do think violence and hatred is bad, full stop. Sorry, I do. It's a moral, absolute moral category. I would rather see the people who think it have their arguments exposed. The biggest experiment we've ever seen of that is Donald Trump. Yeah. 
where the you know it's fucking just fell apart because most people saw he was a cock regardless of what he'll tell you and that you probably won't see someone like him for a long while now yeah, but it's, you're right and it, that sort of right wing sentiment rose around the world at the same time like bolsonaro yeah even here in europe all at the same time and it almost feels like now it's falling a I little bit away. I don't like chastity belts and, and gagging and things. And that the when they were like, Donald Trump's coming, but we won't give him a state visit. Nonsense. I want red carpet. I want streets lined. And let him hear what we think. Let him see the way British people show they're unhappy. Don't sort of all mutter into your tea cozies and send memes like in Shoreditch. Fuck, let's go out there. Let's, 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 where's our pranksters? Where's Simon Brodkin doing a, a stunt on him? You know, to have the courage of your of your arguments. The goodies always win in films, and they will win on the earth. I believe that. I'm an optimist. Should anybody be cancelled, deplatformed, chucked off, immediately thrown out? <clears throat> Not in haste. That's why I make Evil Genius. It's a it's a slow weighing up over the hour. We take the good and the bad, and we have an intellectual discussion. It's very tongue in cheek and funny, but it's a long discussion about the people's merits. <clears throat> it's interesting as well, the elitism of it as well. Why are Picasso's paintings still hanging? Why? The guy was a grade A nonce and misogynist. Why are his paintings still up? Because it's so lofty and important. We can't quite bring ourselves to cancel it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if, oh, do we go here? I mean, I don't know what I think of that Michael Jackson documentary anyway, but it's almost like Michael Jackson's so powerful and musically important that we dare not go there. So it comes to a stage where we're not willing, you know, someone's sort of cancel proof. I mean, if you want to be really controversial, look at the Old Testament. He did some vile fucking things, <laughs> stoning people, like uh, flooding people with fire, burning gays. How has he not been cancelled, old school God? <laughs> <laughs> Too powerful. <laughs> That's interesting. I've never actually considered that. Some people are too. Michael Jackson's a, a very good example because I don't want to give it. My my, my Spotify's going to be empty. Jackson. I've only just got over bump and grind being deleted. <laughs> <laughs> I, do you know, it's funny because I was actually thinking about Michael Jackson this week because I just absolutely adore the art. Yeah. And have it, the thought of having to separate my, the, the artist from the art and that the artist could have been such a horrible predator it it's something that helps, you know. It just I mean, the useful rule of thumb I've found is <clears throat> the closer the art is to the predation and the nature of the predation, the more problematic it is. Yeah. So I find Picasso very problematic because everything I'm looking at in the studio is, in a gallery, is possibly a teenage girl's body. Hmm. I find Michael Jackson problematic because when he's talking about love and I want to be close to you and I want to touch this and that, what's he singing about? What am I dancing to? Yeah. If someone writes beautiful romantic novels, but they like harming animals in private, less problematic. <clears throat> because when I'm reading the novel, I'm not absorbing animal harm. Sure. Am I absorbing paedophilia? If the song, if, who's R. Kelly singing about? Bump and grind with whom? An underage, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So what's, what's next for you? What are you working on? What's, um, what's the next chapter of your life all about as far as you're con concerned? Well, uh, as well as just doing TV all the time, whoring it up on any show that will have me, which I've been doing since I started, it's about the theatres reopening. Um, for now, outdoor socially distanced performance. So I'll be finding as many spaces where I can put a marquee over, vent it at the side, just to get back out there and stay sharp. I am working on a novel. I always am. I'm working on a sitcom. I always am. And I'm developing formats. I always am. I'm always hustling, always trying. I'm yet to get that format away where I own it and it's my IP. I have with Evil Genius. I have, I have made a TV pilot of that with BBC Studios. I would love to sell that because I think that would work globally as a format. Very timely so as well. I have got my eye on things like that as well. But mostly it's how can I get in front of people and make them laugh? Because that's what I want to do. Well, uh, you certainly are very good at that. Um, I, I, it's, it's a talent that you have that I'm like positively jealous of. Like just your oh, great, natural ability there. to make people feel comfortable and to laugh. It's a real I feel the same with you starting challenge. multi-million pound businesses. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I wish I had that. I feel like I would have been more successful if I had that. I trade you for one year, and we both, we both keep revenue. <laughs> no, 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 no deal. <laughs> thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> no, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure, and I don't think people realise how much of a fucking intellectual you are. I, my first clue was all those books you had behind you on your Zoom background when I did your podcast. But I dug my way out the ghetto with books like that. You're so funny. fucking smart, and I don't think oh, people mate. realise that. I think they think you're a comedian. You're much more than a comedian. You're a fucking genius at the same time. It doesn't so. pay to look too smart when you're a comic. True, Otherwise, unrelated. You know, I love Radio 4, but I want to be on ITV1 as well. No disrespect, ITV1. <laughs>
<laughs> Listen, thank you so much for your time today. And um, people people know where they can find you, but your podcast, Evil Genius, is, is immense and it's very timely and needed in our society. So yeah. thank you for doing that. And I am trying to squeeze out stand up on Channel 4 during the day. So if you're ever at home or you've got a day off, Steph's packed lunch twice a week. I'm on there doing that. I never thought I'd do days on telly, but I fucking I love it. And I do stand up at 1 p.m. The world needs that too right now. Yeah. So. Thank you so much, Russell. Appreciate Cheers, it. Thank you. Thank you.